we know that, you know, outside is not the safest place for people to be living. Tonight, Camp pick a wee win in downtown Edmonton is closed down. Since he came back from the war, it's, he's always had this fight in him. And honouring 98-year-old veteran Philip Favel at the Canadian War Museum. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. Nunavut has their fourth case of COVID-19, and now it's in three different Nunavut communities. Earlier this week, the government announced the territory's first COVID-19 cases. Today's newest case is in Arviat, just north of Churchill, Manitoba. The patient has symptoms serious enough that they were medevaced to Winnipeg. The others? two in Santa Kilowak and one in Rankin Inlet. Now every community in the central Kivilak region is under lockdown. Schools are closed, indoor gatherings are banned and all travel between those communities as well. The one thing that all cases have in common, they all did 14 days quarantine in Winnipeg. While the common travel history is concerning, we are not yet able to say with certainty how these individuals were exposed to COVID-19. For that reason, and considering there are now two cases in the region, we have decided to uh, tighten restrictions and increase public health measures across the Kivalik. The Atikamak communities of Manawan and Waymo Tashi got by without any positive cases of COVID-19 during the first wave of the pandemic. With more than 10 cases now reported between the two communities, they're pulling out all the stops to curb the spread. Manawan and Waymo Tashi are located just north of the Lanadere region. With 1,600 cases of COVID-19 and counting, it's currently one of Quebec's most active regions. As a, as a result, the adjacent communities are locking down. More than 200 tests were performed in two weeks. Visitors are being turned away. But pandemic task force workers say following stay-at-home orders and finding places to quarantine is difficult as the communities are overpopulated. The committee had requisitioned two houses in Joliet. Uh, dont uh, le foyer, il y a un foyer uh, autochtone. L'autre, c'est la maison du conseil. On a quand même une vingtaine de places uh, jusqu'à date. Pour le moment, on, on s'ajuste avec ce qu'on a, puis on fait la demande auprès de la santé. Uh, ça va être plus uh, peut-être au, au niveau des ressources. Je pense qu'on va avoir besoin uh, bientôt. In Ottawa today at the federal update on Canada's efforts against COVID-19, the Prime Minister announced money to battle unemployment with a focus on vulnerable communities. Trudeau confirmed $1.5 billion towards workforce development. The money will go to provinces and territories for employment service centres already in place. This is his first step in his promise to bring employment back up to pre-pandemic levels. This new investment will ensure quick access to training so that workers in sectors hardest hit by COVID-19, as well as underrepresented groups like persons with disabilities, women and Indigenous peoples, can find and keep good jobs. This is another step towards creating a million jobs and rebuilding an inclusive economy that benefits all Canadians. To other news now, in the occupation of the Mackenzie Meadows housing development at Caledonia, Ontario, has now been dragging on for 118 days. A group of mainly Haudenosaunee people from the adjacent Six Nations territory and their supporters blocked off the area in early August. They say the land is theirs. The Ontario Provincial Police arrested several of them when they enforced an injunction to remove the barricades asked for by the owners of the housing development. But the barricades went up again and are still there. Skylar Williams speaks for the group occupying the construction site. We hope and we've, we've been hoping and praying for a peaceful result in all of this. And if the 
feds and the province don't start getting here with some some real negotiations um, and the OPP is left to uh, enforce the injunctions on both the roads and the and the development um, you know it means a lot more of our people will be getting hurt and a lot more of our people will be going to jail and so that continuous criminalization of land defenders is uh, is something that we take really really seriously and you can find more on that story on our website, aptnnews.ca. We're going to step aside for a quick break, but stick around. Still to come, a camp for those without a home is shutting down. Working with organizers, uh, we agreed to peacefully and, you know, safely closing down the encampment together. Welcome back. Camp Pico Ewin has been home for hundreds of homeless people in downtown Edmonton since July. But earlier this week, camp organizers and the city agreed to close the camp. There were still a dozen tents standing after the closure, but the last few residents were evicted yesterday. Chris Stewart has more. Police have removed the remaining dozen or so people who did not leave after Camp Pikawiwin officially closed on Saturday, November 7th. A fence now surrounds the large area next to Remax Field in downtown Edmonton. And tarps are being put up to block the view. Edmonton police are going through of what remains of the camp. Lots of tents and belongings are still here. Crystal Kajenner is the director of affordable housing and homelessness for the city of Edmonton. She says that the city has enough room in the several shelters to house everyone who needs it. We know that, you know, outside is not the safest place for people to be living. And that's especially true as the temperatures get really cold and the snow comes. And so um, working with organizers, uh, we agreed to peacefully and, you know, safely closing down the encampment together. A youth counselor who calls himself Raider says he does not believe there is enough room available. We had a pregnant mom just recently who got turned away from the Shah, the Commonwealth, and then I believe also either it was the Bissell or the Mustard Seed, where they weren't able to get accommodations, and then they had to come back to camp the night before the eviction. But then the, during the day of, we were able to get them into a hotel room, thanks to, I believe, either Bissell or Boyle. Raylene Carter is a longtime resident of the camp. She says she is afraid to go to a shelter with the COVID pandemic. I mean, if you're going to put a whole bunch of people anywhere from 10 to 300, what they do have at the Shaw Conference Center, and expect them to stay there. And if one person gets sick, it's like walking into a death trap. From what I'm thinking is, we were right. I was right to stay outside here. She says she will be staying at a friend's place soon, but will be sleeping outside until then and doesn't understand why they were evicted. It is what it is, and we've been forced out of this location. So to me, it's just another form of sweeping it under the rug and saying that we did the best we could with what we had. But I think it's, it's a very unsophisticated fashion to handle people, especially when they're dealing with our lives. So now, the only people at Camp Pikawiwin are the police. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Hope everyone has a warm place this winter. The BC Civil Liberties Association has launched a lawsuit against RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky. It's regarding alleged inaction from the RCMP in releasing a much anticipated civilian watchdog report on how the RCMP spied on Indigenous and climate activists. For more, we spoke earlier with Harsha Walia, Executive Director of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Archer, thanks for being with us. Uh, why has the BC LA decided to take this unusual step and sue the head of the RCMP? Yeah, so the BC Civil Liberties Association is suing the RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky uh, because she's effectively sabotaged the civilian oversight process. So the CRCC is a civilian independent oversight body that uh, is tasked with overseeing the conduct and misconduct of the RCMP. And the CRCC has repeatedly said that they uh, basically are hamstrung. Their hands are tied when it comes to responses from the RCMP. In our case, we made a complaint back in 2014, six years ago, 
to the CRCC uh, about RCMP spying and RCMP spying on Indigenous land defenders and climate organizations uh, at the then, the time of the opposition of the then Enbridge Gateway Pipeline. It's been so long that, as we know, that's no longer even Enbridge. Mm -hmm. um, that's not even the Enbridge Pipeline anymore, and that pipeline is, is long gone. Uh, but, you know, what happened is back in 2017, the CRCC then wrote an interim report, which is not public, that they passed on to the RCMP. And the process requires the RCMP to respond to that report before we get the final report and before the public can even find out what happened to uh, what, what is in the content of that report. So for three years, the RCMP commissioner has been sitting on this interim report. We have no idea what's in there. People who have been, who are under surveillance, you know, for all those years have no idea uh, what, the conduct, what the context of that report is. And so we decided to sue the RCMP because enough is enough. And it is completely unacceptable that the RCMP continues to sit on this report. We have since found out that they're sitting on 148 other reports all of which are directly related to the RCMP conduct and misconduct. And, you know, it's frankly shameful and disgraceful that for Canadians to find out uh, and to get access to information about the RCMP, that they actually have to wait this long. This is completely unacceptable. And, you know, we have the privilege of being a legal organization with resources to do this. You can imagine the hundreds and thousands of families, particularly Indigenous folks and land defenders, who have made complaints against the RCMP, who have been sitting there for years, uh, seeing that these complaints are going nowhere. And we are seeing and hearing a lot about those, the Colton Bushy report, we're just getting the Elsie Bucktuck one. Uh, in your opinion, do you think there is a reason why yeah. the RCMP are withholding this report? Uh, you know what? I, I don't know. Only they really know why they're sitting on it. But, you know, as you point out, there's many other reports that they've been sitting on, including the one uh, with respect to Colton Bushi and many others. And this is unacceptable. It is completely unacceptable. As we know, the CRCC is already, frankly, completely ineffective and it's a broken complaint system. Uh, and, you know, they can't make any recommendations. Oftentimes, the first kind of point of contact for a complaint is the RCMP investigating itself. There's just so many structural flaws that on top of that, to have these delays is completely disgraceful. Arsha, when we look at the recent clash in Nova Scotia over the lobster fishery, do you feel the RCMP have come down harder on Indigenous climate activists than the non-Indigenous people involved in the fishery dispute? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, it is indisputable that the RCMP is a tool of colonization and that it is a completely racist organization. And the ways in which we see that is the very clear discrepancy and the different ways in which indigenous people, black people, communities of color are treated compared to white people all across this country. Um, and, you know, one of the most blatant ways in which that played out absolutely was in Mi'kma'ki, uh, when we see the criminalization of Mi'kma'ki fishers uh, and the kind of hands-off approach that the RCMP have had uh, with, you know, really violent uh, white fisher people and settlers uh, attacking people in Mi'kma'ki. And, you know, that is really just a symptom of a much deeper problem, which is, you know, the on, you know systemic racism policing is almost... Uh, it's almost uh, redundant because the police are always racist. There are not only some racist police. The police as a, as an institution uh, were founded in racism and colonization of these lands. And so we see that repeated in the RCMP. We see it repeated in every police force and in every kind of statistic that we can gather for decades, right? Street check data, arrest data, incarceration data, charges, sentencing. Every, you know, every step of the way in the criminal justice process, we see Indigenous people overrepresented um, and overcriminalized. Harsha, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, appreciate you taking some time for us. That's Harsha Walia of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Thanks for having me. Time now for one more quick break. Still to come, a special ceremony for a First Nations veteran. We're really, really never recognized nationally. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. The season is changing all across Turtle Island and this photo comes to us from Jeffrey Amos. Some early morning frost from the Mackenzie Delta region in British Columbia. That is a cool picture. 
you can send your seasonal photos to us at share at aptn.ca. Next week, APTN's live show In Focus is talking about traditional foods. So we'd love to see your home-cooked food, and maybe your dish will be our next photo of the day. Time now to take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting with Halifax, rain and seven similar temperatures in Charlottetown. Minus five in Nain and Happy Valley Goose Bay with some cloud. Six above with showers for Montreal. Minus two and snow in Chibugamu. Seven in showers in Toronto. Plus six and sunny for Sault Ste. Marie. Plus four for Thunder Bay. Two above in Sioux Lookout. Minus two in God's Lake. Two below in Norway House with snow. Plus three and a chance of rain for Winnipeg. One above in Brandon and Dauphin. Minus two with snow for Regina. Five below and more snow for Saskatoon. Eleven below and snow in Uranium City and Stony Rapids. Over in northern Alberta, minus eleven for Fort Chip. Twelve below with snow in high level. Zero and snow for Medicine Hat. Zero with showers for Calgary. Plus eight with rain in Vancouver. Plus three and sunny in Kamloops. Minus 12 with snow for Fort Nelson, plus 1 in Smithers. Minus 24 for Old Crow, 6 below in Whitehorse. Minus 17 with snow on the way for Yellowknife, 20 below and snow for Norman Wells. Minus 17 with snow for Saks Harbor, minus 20 in Colville Lake. 29 below in Baker Lake, minus 15 in Chesterfield. Minus 20 with snow in Resolute and Joe Haven. Well, Wednesday was Remembrance Day, marking the 75th anniversary to the end of World War II. And Sunday was Indigenous Veterans Day. Jamie Pashagumscum brings us this story of a First Nations veteran and Indigenous rights warrior. I don't know why I did what I was supposed to do. 98-year-old Philip Favel from the Sweetgrass First Nation in Saskatchewan is known for advocating for the rights of Indigenous veterans. This week, the World War II veteran was honoured with the unveiling of his portrait. His granddaughter, Nadine, is proud of her grandfather's legacy. Since he came back from the war, it's, he's always had this fight in him. And, and that's what he, he's done all his life. You know, he's, he's tried to you know, speak, for, speak up for the veterans because they, you know, they, were, um, they weren't given the same rights as the other veterans were. And still to this day, you know, they still don't. This was a point also brought up by AFN National Chief Perry Belgard. And there were equals over there, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, equals. But when they came back, we say they became Indians again. And by that, what I mean, they didn't go to Veterans Affairs for their benefits. They went to the Department of Indian Affairs. Veteran James Eagle was part of the project and chose Favel as the veteran to be honoured. But we're real, real and never recognised nationally or worldly about, about the sacrifices that our, our Anishinaabe vet, uh, veterans, warriors, uh, done. During the war, Favel drove ammunition and gas to the front lines. Ottawa artist Elaine Goebel says the portrait represents an important part of Canadian history. I am overwhelmingly touched and honoured to have the opportunity not to work as an insular artist in my studio, but to work with this wonderful village that just grows and grows and is filled with so much love. It's an honour. Goebel was commissioned for three copies of the portrait. One will go to Favel, another will hang in the War Museum as a tribute and as an act of reconciliation. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. Great story, great honour. Mi'kmaq and black communities in Nova Scotia share a long history of racism, but there are plenty of examples happening in real time in 2020. The conclusion to racism lives here too. Airs tonight on APTN Investigates. Trina Roach is the reporter and joins us now. 
Katrina, thanks for being with us. We've been covering the backlash against the Mi'kmaq here on the news in Nova Scotia throughout the fall. How did that fit into your documentary? Well, you know, it really illustrates the point that racism is alive and well in, in 2020. Um, you know, my doc uh, it does focus on, on a lot of, like, historical aspects, the history of Mi'kmaq and black connections, but it's, it just shows that it's a very um, current discussion, a very current issue that we're seeing unfold uh, here on the ground and, and on the water. Um, and, you know, when we're naming our episodes, um, you're trying to come up with a title and after uh, George Floyd was killed uh, in, the, in the States and we saw the Black Lives Matter rallies sort of erupt all over the world here at home too, I found like on social media um, and in commentary, there's kind of this sense sometimes in Canada that we look south of the border and we say, whew, like we're, mm -hmm. we're not like that. Thank goodness we're, we're here. And I think people really don't realize like there's a very long history of slavery uh, in Canada, in Nova Scotia, like from the start of colonization. And Nova Scotia is actually the site of North America's first recorded race riots, um, happened here. And actually, it happened about a half an hour from West Pubnico, uh, so 1783, those first race riots, happened about a half an hour drive from West Pubnico, which is where that lobster pound uh, was set on fire. Um, as part of those protests against the Mi'kmaq fishery. So you see those, those simmering uh, tensions around race um, that happen in the province that have happened for a very long time. And I think that the Mi'kmaq fishery and the backlash against that just shows how current this is and that it's a lived experience today uh, in 2020. What are you hoping that people take away from part two tonight? You know, the, a major theme throughout all of my interviews that I did for this uh, documentary uh, is that education is needed. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I learned a lot through the course of making the documentary. Um, but that, that, you know, it's not an education that we get in, in schools. Mm -hmm. And in Nova Scotia, there is treaty education. So there is a push to get Mi'kmaq history and culture into mainstream uh, classrooms. But I mean, by the time you get to, to high school, African Nova Scotian studies and Mi'kmaq studies, they're electives, right? You can opt out of those courses. And so I think, you know, there, there's a sense that these are histories and stories that aren't well documented, especially when you're looking at the connection between sort of two marginalized groups, like here, you know, we have Mi'kmaq and, and African Nova Scotian communities, that those histories aren't well documented, that they're stories that aren't often told. And so I think going forward, I would hope that people watch the documentary, but then maybe, you know, look for that sort of history. I mean, we live in the age of Google, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of information right at our fingertips. Tips. And so I'm hoping that that sort of there's a space and a place for those voices and stories uh, going forward um, in, in other in other ways. So that's that's kind of my hope going forward. Well, it was a real uh, interesting history lesson. Uh, looking forward to part two tonight. Thanks, Trina. Thanks, Dennis. And you can catch the second half of Racism Lives Here Too on APTN Investigates in about two minutes time. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this second Friday, the 13th of 2020. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Stick around for APTN Investigates. That's next. Have a great night.